turn, please, to the book of First Peter. First Peter. I'm deliberately going to preach and not uh, reminisce or try to say a lot of things, because if I did, I'd be at one o'clock. So I'm going to read the scriptures and preach. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pompeii, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and the Senate. The elect. Do you think, does that sound as bad to you as it does to me? Uh, my teeth are in, but it sounds as if they weren't. Uh, that's uh, bothering you back there? Where are you standing in here? Any place at all? And there never, never two of these alike. They're all different. Now I'll start again with verse two. The elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and the unity be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, preserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, but the trial of your faith is much more precious than a gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Now I have in mind particularly verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. The Bible is very sparing in its adjective. And when it uses one, there's always a reason. He didn't say wherein ye rejoice. Well, this is an adverb, really. But it's a modifier. And uh, he says wherein ye greatly rejoice. So now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness, through, and he could have said temptation, but he didn't, he said manifold temptation. Now that's what I want to talk about. He said in verse 5, unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now these Christians look for a state of things faith to them, to all the New Testament Christians, faith was not a nickel in the slot, pull down the lever and take what you want and go and write a tract about it. That, that's our idea of faith. But to the, old, to the old Christians of New Testament times, faith was a telescope. And they looked far off. And oftentimes, death interrupted them while they were looking and they died with a smile on their face, looking far off. And seeing the things that were to come, and thus they all died in faith. Now these Christians, uh, to whom Peter wrote, Peter himself, looked for a state of things immeasurably better than anything we know now or they knew then. It was to be that state, perfect and complete, and ye that have begun a good work will perfect it until the day of Christ. And it was to affect your body. First Corinthians 15 deals with that. But there's a time coming when we're going to have better bodies. We're very body conscious people. We even have a new disease. 
called psychosomatic disease. Psycho means your nerves and mind, and somatic means your body. So they teach us now that we get sick in our body because our mind is not well. And they, were, they think they've discovered something. And actually, John the Beloved knew that 2,000 years ago and wrote that I pray that you may, your soul may prosper, your body may prosper, even as your soul prospers. He knew that. He knew all about psychosomatic long before these fellows from universities knew about it. And uh, we, uh, the early Christians, believed that there was a time coming, Paul wrote about it in a long chapter in First Corinthians, when we'd have a body somewhat like our own, but glorified and like Jesus Christ, and immortal so it couldn't die, and incorruptible so it couldn't rot, and perfect so that you couldn't add anything to it, uh, like Jesus. And Paul took a whole chapter to tell us about that. I didn't used to read that chapter with any great amount of interest, but I'm very much interested in it lately, and I think you know why. Because I am nearing, uh, a little nearer now than the time when I first was running around these grounds with my hair black and in place. And now what I have is gray, but uh, where the rest of it is, God only knows I don't. Now, not only was the body to be affected for the better, but the mind and the soul also. John told us that, uh, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and we do not yet know what we're going to be like, but we do know this much. When we, he returns and we see him, we're going to be like him. Now, that's all I ask for, my brethren. I don't ask for anything any more than that. For that reason, I am not going to write any books on the state of the body in the glorified uh, condition. Because I don't know very much about it, but I know that if we're going to be like him, that will be enough for all the saints and angels and seraphim and cherubim for all time to come. And then in Romans 8, Paul tells us that even the earth is going to be better off. He tells us that conditions at that time are going to be better, for he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of the end who had subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So those Christians were looking forward to a time when even nature should be purified, and we should be delivered from the curses round about us. There'd be no tidal waves and no cloud burst and no floods and no forest fires and no polio and no cancer and uh, nothing wrong with the earth. No, no memorial park, which is a high pollutant name for a graveyard. Uh, nothing like that, but that the whole creation, the earth and all its creatures, should be delivered from the groaning bondage of, uh, of death and sin. And then society itself will be cleaned up, and the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And you know that those Christians lived, as a result, in a state of optimism. They were an optimistic crowd, these early Christians. They were cheerful. They were alert and poised, and the note of rejoicing is high and clear throughout all the New Testament after Calvary. Before Calvary, there were sad, pensive notes that would creep in, even into the language of Jesus. That's when he said, you know, don't you, that the Son of Man is going up to Jerusalem to be betrayed and crucified. It was a sad note there. But after the resurrection, there never was a minor note. He never sang a song in a minor key. Everything was major. Everything had in it the clear ring. There were no cracked liberty bells in the New Testament. They all rang clear the blue sky because they knew that salvation was ready to be revealed and they were looking for it. They weren't too much concerned with what they had here because they were looking for something to come. And he said, wherein he greatly rejoiced. I say that this note of rejoicing was in the New Testament, and it's in historic Christianity. You'll find it all down the years, 
The Christians, they were a singing group, my brethren. I have made something of a study, just a lay from a layman's standpoint, of the other religions of the world. And while they had some poetry, and they do have some songs, there, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing in any of the great religions of the world that can even venture to be compared with the lyric beauty of the New Testament hymnody. We sing in the New Testament, and we sing because we can't help it. They, Jesus sang and went to the Mount of Olives, and he said, I will sing among my brethren. When he rose from the dead, he sang among his brethren. Paul and Silas sang in the prison, and the angel's arm of might smote the prison gates at night. The church is a singing church. And every time the Holy Ghost fell on an area, in any period of church's history, they sang. They sang among the mystics, back in the days of Paul Gerhardt and Terstegan. They sang in Luther's time, and the Pope was scared to death of Luther's song. He didn't hate Luther's theology half as bad as he singing. He said, why, they're singing themselves into Lutheranism. He said, they'll sing themselves into Protestantism, we don't look out. But what are you going to do with the power? You can't make him stop singing. If you pull his tongue out and pull his teeth, you'll sing in his heart. And if you sing inside, you sing. And I sing all most of the time inside, because I don't want to subject my friends around me to the uh, necessity of hearing me sing uh, vocally. So I sing inside. I sing on buses and streetcars and airplanes. And wherever I happen to be, there's a song inside, you know. Well, now the historic church was a happy singing church. Now, why? Ye great ear joy. Well, because of what she was looking forward to. But I want you to notice the contradiction here. I've had it said about me that I contradict myself. They say, Joseph, you're self-contradictory. But I want you to know if that is true, I take it as a very high compliment because I'm in apostolic succession. Our Lord Jesus Christ was forever contradicting himself. That is, seeming to contradict himself. Actually, he never did. He just seemed to. He said, for instance, in one place, don't let anybody know your right hand know what your left hand does. Another place, his light so shine before men that everybody will see it and glorify your father who's art in heaven. Now, you explain that to me, will you? That's a contradiction. But if you know the meaning, it isn't a contradiction. And Paul was everlastingly getting up and sounding contradictory. And it's been that way all down the years, and that's the sermon this morning, how what queer birds Christians are, what self-contradictory people they are, and how hard they are to understand, and as soon as you can understand them, they're not Christians anymore. And he says here, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now ye are in, in uh, heaviness. Ye rejoice in heaviness, and you're heavy in your rejoicing. Now explain that to me, will you? You know, my friends, now is the time. Now is the time. A fellow told me yesterday on the grounds this. said he came to my rescue and popped on it, and he heard a conversation about me, and a fellow said this. He said if Tozer was ever for anything, he'd have to tell what he wasn't, what he was against in order to explain what he was for. Well, I don't mind that, because, you know, as long as everything's wrong, you got to be against it. But if it all started right, I'd be for it. If the parade was moving in the right direction, I'd fall in step and march along. But if the parade is marching over a cliff, I'm going to stand and yell and try to turn the herd. And naturally, when you're trying to turn the herd, you're, you're, you're on the opposite side of things. And as soon as you go along with the herd, or maybe I'd better say flock, for the Lord said we receive not cattle. As soon as you try to turn the, the, the flock, everybody says you're against everything. Of course, I'm against the devil, and I'm against sin, and I'm against worldliness, and I'm against the flesh, and I'm against Christianity that pretends to be Christianity and isn't. I'm against this spiritual ignorance that is trying to harmonize Christianity with the world. It's absolutely futile to try to do it. There was a day when our religious leaders were made fun of and laughed at and opposed, even uh, taken and put, put in jail or driven out of town or whatever. But nowadays, they're ridden on the shoulders of the mobs and the multitudes. Because they're trying to make Christianity as much like the world as possible in order to win the world. That's the philosophy of the present hour. Try to make Christianity like the world. Win them. Show that it's just, just like them on just a little higher, and pretty soon you'll win them. 
Well, don't we know this, that Christianity demands the impossible and secures it? Don't we know that Christianity cuts straight across the instincts of man? Don't we know that the message of Jesus Christ runs contrary to man and not in favor of man? And don't we know, as one man said, and he wasn't a Christian, but he just had sense enough, you know Christians, I, I've given up on Christians. We're the dumbest lot that God ever allowed to walk around. I don't know how we ever managed to remember our own telephone numbers. We're so stupid. And we accept anything, and we had no sense of proportion, no vision, no insight, no discernment, no knowledge. And we can be taken in, and we put a fact check into a envelope and send it off to some scoundrel that ought to be in jail. And we wipe our misty eyes and think we've done God's service. And God's born-again people are helping to finance rascals that ought to be in jail and not, not, not to be allowed to be out at all. God's poor, dumb children, I don't understand them. Anyhow, this man said this, that it is one of the anomalies of history that each generation has had to be converted by the saints that contradicted it the most. Instead of that, we say we make converts by harmonizing with the world and getting adjusted to it. And history shows that they make converts by contradicting the world. Jesus Christ stood to contradict. John the Baptist stood to contradict and to oppose. He was a protester and a Protestant, a Protestant. And all the church, great church leaders down the years have been protesters. They stood in hostility to the times in which they lived, not a harmony with them. And the worst thing you could possibly say about a man of God is that everybody loves him and, and they harmonize with him and they, they feel he's a fine cat. Worst thing possible. Now, uh, though ye are in great heaviness, and one version says, even though for a little time, it is next uh, translated, ye are pained by troubles of many times. Now, here we have it. Rejoicing, though pained and in trouble. Now, they were strange people, weren't they? They were rejoicing while they were in trouble. But remember, my brethren, that the power of the, of the gospel of Christ, the power of the church, always lies in its antithesis and never in its agreement. It always lies in its contradictions and never in its compromises. As soon as a man compromises one inch, he's lost some power. And if he compromises a little more, he's lost a little more power. And the further he compromises, he loses progressively more power until finally he has no power at all. And that's what's wrong with the world now. But anyhow, I want to talk a little bit about these strange persons, Christians, these strange people. And uh, when they call you strange, don't let it bother you. I hope you're even good enough Christians they call you a holy roller occasionally. I hope that. When we last people got over being called holy rollers, we got over the power that used to characterize our meetings. I don't mind being called a holy roller. The president of a seminary was talking about me the other day, and he said Tozer is a legalistic sanctificationist. Now, I didn't mind that at all. I, I rather take that as a compliment. I was afraid I was getting a little too popular with some of my fundamentalist brethren. But this fellow, rather, he rather scuttled my ship and sunk me there. He said I was a legalistic sanctificationist. Now, I don't know what either word means, but it's all right because he wasn't on my side. He was against me. Now, uh, have you noticed this about a Christian? You wonder why, wonder why you don't get along so well and why people think you're queer. Well, I'll tell you, if you're a true Christian, not if you're a hypocrite or a half-saved, then I have nothing to say to you now. Mason will say that tonight. But uh, if you're a true Christian, I got this to preach to you. Have you noticed this about a Christian? That uh, he's dead and yet he lives forever. Now, now that's an odd thing. He says, I have died and I am alive. And the world says, make up your mind, bud. Are you dead or are you alive? Well, he says, I died, but I'm living. And uh, I live by another's death. And the reason I'm alive is because somebody else died. And they say, I knew they were off. I knew that the, that the lid had grown somewhere when they joined that last church. That uh, they're dead and yet living, and that the reason they're living is because somebody else died. And the one that died isn't dead anymore, but he's living. And they're living in the one that is living, and they're all, all, all up to fishing. Let's give it up. There's no use of that. And uh, you know that a Christian, my brother, that a Christian finds himself uh, at, at home on the earth, he ought to have another dip. 
because a Christian doesn't belong here really. You ever notice that swan down in New Jersey where I go to preach sometimes at New Jersey Kevin? They have a big lake, two big lakes there, and they have swans. And these great big white swans, particularly the cub, that is the male swan, he'll come out on the bank, chase people away from his mate, he's cutting, he chase her over, chase them away. When he's out on the water, he is a, he is a vision of loveliness. Pure, sparkling whiteness, gracefully moving along through the water. But when he gets up on the land, he looks like something that was sent for and couldn't be found. He wobbles and he waddles and his great big old hat hung over the front uh, end, bumps on the ground, and his legs stick out and he's the weirdest looking thing. But let him get into the water and he's a beautiful thing to look at. Same with a night hawk. You ever see a night hawk down on the ground? He's got little whiskers on the side of his feet and his legs are placed so far back on the chassis that the whole front end of him tumbles over. And he's, a, he's an ugly, awkward looking thing on the ground. But in the air at sundown, when he's dancing and turning and circling and diving and getting his supper on the wing, he is, a, he is a vision of charm and grace. Now, if, you, if, if, if a Christian belonged down here, then he'd, be, he'd try to fit in and be grace, gracious and graceful, and, but he doesn't belong here, and that's why a Christian is very often awkward down on the world. Christian goes to a meeting somewhere where he has to be, maybe he's a businessman, he has to be, and everybody around, nobody around him is a Christian. He's all out of place. He doesn't know what to do. And uh, you find yourself in a group of relatives, and none of them converted, and, and uh, they try to be nice to you, but there's a difference, you know. Because you're, you're a swan out on the land. You're, you're, a, you're a bird down on the ground. And a Christian belongs up yonder, and still he's down here, and there's another contradiction. I ask if he belongs up yonder, why is he down here? Well, now let's look at some more of these contradictions. I notice that a Christian saves his life by losing it, and as soon as he tries, tries to save it, he loses it. And uh, if, he, if he seeks to save his soul, he, he loses it, and if he's willing to give himself up to death, he saves himself. Now, that's unheard of, brethren. And yet that's Christianity now, that's it. That's what the Lord said. He said, he that would lose his life, you'll find it, and he that finds it, and keeps it, and, and cuddles it up to himself, he loses it. Jesus our Lord said that. And then have you noticed that, uh, that a Christian is somebody that surrenders in order to conquer. Everywhere else they conquer in order to conquer, and when they can't fight anymore, they surrender and give up and admit they're defeated. But a Christian wins by surrendering. There was an example in the Old Testament. A man named Jacob lived back there. I always loved Jacob because he was about like I am, and miserable and more or less, you know, when nature made him, she had a smile on her face and put him together rather loosely. And uh, God found him, crooked old guy that he was, and made him into Israel. But I haven't been made into Israel yet, so I'm still in the Jacob stage. But uh, have you noticed that Jacob surrendered on the banks of the Peniel in order that he might win the next day down in the valley? Uh, Jacob surrendered and gave up and uh, said, Oh, Lord, bless me, I won't let you go. He was hanging on the rope, asking God to bless him. And God blessed him, and by blessing a conquered Jacob, he won over an angry, murderous Esau. And God always has it that way. In the world, they teach you, stick your jaw out, inflate your chest, and go out and tell the world who you are. And the Bible tells you that if you want to win over anybody, go to your prayer chamber and, and die and surrender and give up. Then go out and meet him. And when you meet him, you fall on your neck and kiss you, the way you saw this. Have you noticed this about these strange people called Christians? That they're strongest when they're weakest and weakest when they're strongest. And if they think they're strong, they're weak, and when they think they're weak, they're strong. So the Lord knows, you see, that's why we're so awkward. We're like swans out on the lawn walking around. We bump and our legs waddle, and we're just not, we don't belong down here. We're strange people looking for that salvation which is ready to be revealed. Have you noticed that a Christian again is strange in that uh, he's poor, and yet he's able to make other people rich? And as soon as he gets rich, he stops making other people rich. And as soon as the preacher gets rich, he starts making his congregation poor. And as long as he keeps his congregation rich. Now that's the law of God, brethren. And it's a strange law of God. In this world of ours, if you're rich, you make others rich. But in the kingdom of heaven, when you're poor, you make others rich. And Paul said he had nothing, yet everybody was rich around the body. And that's the odd thing. 
Have you noticed that a Christian is highest when he feels lowest, and usually is lowest when he feels highest? When a Christian meets up with his liver functioning and everything going well, and he's feeling well, he goes out and says amen and praise the Lord when he doesn't have need it, and before nightfall, uh, uh, he's dragging the ground. But if he gets up thinking that he doesn't amount to much and feels low down and just looks to the Lord and trusts him, he'll make it all right through to the night. He'll be higher up at night than he was in the morning. So that's strange. Now what are you going to do with a Christian like that? Somebody said the church has got two classes of people in it. The bad people who think they're good and the good people who think they're bad. And the better the man is, the less he thinks of himself. You know that? I preach sanctification and they blame me. They say, oh, you imagine you're sinless. Well, the odd part about it is that the baptism of the Holy Ghost does cleanse us from sin, but at the same time it delivers us from a feeling that we are so that we're always ready to say, I am of all men the most miserable. I am the least worthy of all men. As soon as you hear a man say, I haven't sinned for 15 years, you know you're hearing a liar talking. And as, you hear, as soon as you hear a man, a few men struck around talking about how the great fellow he is, you know that he's missed it somewhere. So that in the Church of Christ, the good people are always ready to hang their heads and say, no, no, I'm not good, the Lord is good. But the bad people are prepared to say, yes, it can depend on me, and trust me, I'm okay. Well, that's the way it is. So that he's most sinless when he feels the most sinful, and he's richest when he feels the poorest, and he has the most, and he gives the most away. Now, there again, we have it. The only, the only example of that I know of in the world is Washington, D.C., and our foreign aid. They think that if we give more away, we'll get more. And we do get more, too. Tongue lashings and cushions from the people we're helping. But uh, back to where it belongs. That, that was just thrown in. Now, have you noticed, my brethren, that a Christian always has more when he gives more and has less when he withholds more? You never know how much you're worth. They say, how much is a man worth? Well, I don't know how much you're worth, but they tell me the average size man is worth 90 cents in the drugstore. That is, you can buy a component part for 90 cents, but since inflation, it's a dollar thirteen. So now you're worth a dollar thirteen in the market. That's how much you're worth, but uh, you're, you're richest when you don't have much and when God gets it. Then have you noticed that a Christian sometimes does the most by doing nothing? That's always hard for me to understand because by nature and temperament, I'm always two steps ahead of everybody I'm walking with, always up in the morning before others, usually at least, and uh, I like that. And I get ready my sermon long before time to preach it, start with a deep hole long before the trains do, and so on. That's temperament, or is it taking the good or bad? It's just misfortune. But uh, have you ever thought that a Christian sometimes does the most when he isn't doing anything at all? Jesus said to his disciples, come here apart and rest a while. You notice again when the Lord said, you shall receive power and go preach the gospel, and Peter grabbed his hat and started, and the Lord called him back and said, you're not ready yet, wait. Peter said, me wait? I never waited five minutes in my life. He said, it's all right, you wait. You'll get more done by waiting sometimes than you will by plunging in. I am fully convinced that if the Church of Jesus Christ were to call a moratorium on all activity and call a universal retreat and spend ten days waiting on God in penitence and prayer, we'd go further in the next five hours than we've been doing in the last fifty years. We don't wait on God enough. We think that we've got to be active. The magazines, the world in magazines now, are bringing out articles about why preachers are breaking down. I picked up Harper's Magazine uh, on the newsstand on my way here because I wanted to read an article in there written by an ex-preacher. He should have been ex. He was ex before he put the pulpit on. He didn't find it out till later. Uh, about why why preachers are forsaking the pulpit. Well, the, the worldly men say we've got too much to do. Ever stop to think what a preacher has to do? And some of you laymen expect your preacher to be that. A babysitter, a midwife, a, a, a counselor, a tea sipper, and a kid manager, and a golf uh, enthusiast, and a fishing companion, and a doorbell pusher, and a house-to-house -house canvasser, and uh, a ecclesiastical administrator, and a theologian, and a poet, 
and uh, an orator, and uh, he expects him to be all that. Well, nobody that good, brother. They just don't come like that. The angels never would flunk that test, and yet they expect the preacher to do all that. And the devil has invented me that church. The church thinks it's God, but I know who did it. I can smell. I know where it came from. Just like you smell a new car when it runs off the assembly line, I can smell these things. The devil knew that if the preachers, the prophets of God, spent enough time in prayer, he's out of business. And so the devil invented a whole lot of things for preachers to do. And as out is, you poor fellows, rub or run your legs off down to your knees, running around doing things that God never told you to do. Why don't you go to the New Testament and get your orders from Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost and do what you're told and refuse to do what they want you to do? Long ago, I quit a lot of this baloney that been forced preachers to do. I haven't been but one to one or two wedding receptions in the last 25 years. I saw that if I had a wedding Saturday night and then stayed around and heard stale jokes and off-color remarks and all kinds of things up until 11.30, I couldn't preach Sunday morning. So I married the couple, greeted the, the, the bridegroom and congratulated him and went home and to bed. Next day, I was feeling good. Oh, yes, brother. They just think that you've got to always be busy. But there are times, my brother, when you'll get more done by doing nothing than you will by doing something. There are times when the Lord calls a stop and says, Come on, come apart a while, get on your knees, open your Bible, wait, wait there on me and let me talk to you. And then you'll get up from there with a new vision, a new understanding, a new power, and you go out to do ten times as much as you would have before. Hmm? Not only are they finding new things for us to do, but they're finding new subjects to preach on. By the grace of God, up to now, up to this moment, I have never preached on a subject that I was supposed to. I make it, I make it a solemn obligation to myself and God and my congregation never to preach on the thing that the, the world says I'm to preach on. Mama's Day, for instance. Mama's Day. We're all mamas these days. Mamism is captured. On Mama's Day in Chicago, everybody runs around, you know, trickling, blowing his nose, and chances are when he was at home where Mama was, he was a nasty scoundrel and half broke her heart, but now he blows his nose and is misty-eyed about Mama. I got up before my congregation this uh, Mama's Day and this year, and I said, I hope you'll forgive me for not preaching about Mama, because I said, I operate on a commission from God Almighty, and I can't find anything in the terms of my commission that say I should preach on Mother once a year. So I don't preach on Mother. I honor all good mothers. But motherhood doesn't make you good. Motherhood just makes you a mother. And if you're a good woman and you have a baby, you're a good mother. But if you're a bad woman and have a baby, you're a bad mother. Motherhood doesn't sanctify anybody. Why, the cow in the barnyard has a calf. That doesn't sanctify her. That's biological, brother. That's not theological. And yet we go around and they spend a whole day when they could be talking about Jesus Christ in the glory, talking about mothers. And I heard a fellow on the air preaching from the city of Chicago. He told about a dear old preacher. He said to him, he uh, was getting old and sick, and one day he said to me, he said, my friend, I'm old and tired, and I want to go back to the arms of my mother. Now, this was on Mother's Day. An old guy that ought to know better. Did he ever read the third chapter of the book of John? When you're old, you can't go back in your mother's room and be born again. Didn't he know that? But he evidently had it. So the next day, he died. And this brother said about him with a cat in his throat, he said he had gone back to the arms of his mother. Imagine it. The Bible tells me that Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Not mama's arms, but Abraham's arms. My mother's in heaven, and when I see my mother in heaven, I'll greet her and thank God she's there. But I'm not going to be a mom it. Down on my knees, burning candles, some all that's only one thing. Then you've got the boy scouts, you know, and the kinds of animals weak, and the old maids weak, and all that. I don't nothing to do with it. Well, see, brethren, if you're going to have power, you're going to have to stand in sharp contradiction to the world, for the world's wrong. And it's wrong in all that it does. It's wrong. And everything spiritual and moral is wrong. 
And the Christian who is, is somebody who knows what right is and does that right in the wrong world. And have you ever stopped to think that a, furthermore, a Christian's a contradiction in that he's saved now and still talks about the salvation ready to be revealed? And the world says, are you saved? And he says, yes. And he says, well, and then as the world says, what are you waiting for? And he says, salvation. And the world says, you mean you're saved and still waiting for salvation? Now make up your mind. Whose side are you on? Are you saved or are you not saved? And the Christian says, yes, I'm saved. But what I have now is nothing compared with what I'm going to have. So I'm not thinking about the salvation that shall be revealed when Christ comes back. And uh, have you ever thought that a Christian was born on the earth and yet is a citizen of heaven? Now, I was born in the state of Pennsylvania, and therefore I'm an American citizen. But I was born in the sense of Pennsylvania, and therefore, I mean, I was born here and I'm a citizen of the United States, but I was born again, and now I'm no longer a citizen of the United States in the same sense. And the citizen of another country, Paul tells us that. And uh, a Christian is strange in this, that he loves somebody that he's never seen. And is deeply in love with somebody that he never saw, drops down on his knees and raises his hand and looks into the face of somebody he can't see, and talks to him as if he could, and the world says, well, he slips his court. He is talking to somebody. Who is he talking to? Nobody around. But he hears somebody say, Oh, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And he's talking to somebody that's there, only the world looks, and doesn't see anybody and say, What's the matter? The fellow's talking to himself? No, sir. A Christian is a strange creature. You ever stop to think that a Christian fears God but isn't afraid of him? You know, it's possible to be afraid of things with a thorough or endure it. But the Christian has no such fear of God. He gets right up into God's arms because he's God's child. We've had seven children at our house, and there wasn't a one of them ever afraid of me. Never one of them. In fact, I don't know that, that what maybe they went a little too far sometimes in their in their liberty. And even my 17-year-old daughter will be 18 next week, and uh, I'm afraid sometimes that she could take just a little too much liberty, but she isn't afraid of me. And I'm not afraid of God, though I fear God. And so the Christian said, now, now, the world said, now, tell me, you Christian, are you afraid of God or not? He said, no. Do you fear God? Yes. Well, he says, that's semantic distinction between fear and being afraid of. But it's not a semantic distinction. That is a distinction in meaning only. It is an actual meaning. The heathen are afraid of their God. They placate their God the best they can. They tremble and they die for fear sometimes of a curse that's on them. It's fear, psychosomatic death comes to them because they're afraid of their God, but no Christian's afraid of God, he just fears God. He reverences God with a high and beautiful reverence. And at the name of God, he bows his head. The name of God, he keeps still. The name of God, he rejoices, but always he's free to move into the presence of God. Somebody said when Luther prayed, it was an experience to hear him. They said when he gets on his knees at first, he prays with such awful reverence and godly fear that just, it, it's a pity him. But after he's prayed a little while, he begins to break out into such boldness that you fear for him. He wasn't afraid of God, he was just reverent, that's all. Amen. And uh, have you ever thought that if, uh, if you fear God enough, you don't have to be afraid of anything else? You know why some of you are scared to death about one thing and another? Because you don't fear God enough. Some of you go around and look at yourself in the glass and wonder if there's a cancer forming someplace. Now, I'll tell you, I can't give you a cancer cure precisely, but I can give you a cure of fear of it, and that is fear God enough. The Christian that fears God sufficiently never needs to be afraid of anything. Eh, hey, brother. And then he goes down in order to get up. And uh, when he refuses to go down, he's already on his way down. And as soon as he starts down, he's on his way up. Now, that's a contradiction I never could figure out, but it's a fact. And well, that's why we have such trouble preaching this to people. It contradicts everything they learn, you know, and McGuffey just read it. It contradicts everything they read in the newspaper. But it's a fact that if you go down, you'll come out all right up. But if you go start up, you'll go down. Always it's so. And why is this? It's because when you were born, you were born bad. And the only way God can redeem you 
is to contradict that badness, upset it, crucify it, destroy it, trample it underfoot, to give you something new inside your heart. So they are now they're telling us that we got to be philosophers and scientists and they're trying to equate Christianity with philosophy and science. It's absolutely foolish even to try it. Because there's no, no similarity to any philosophy in the world in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said back in the first Corinthian epistle that the, uh, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which I say it is the power of God. It's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. I'll tell you this now, it's close. It's old Brother Mason, isn't it? He's here. He can hear it again, but I was up in Canada there with intervarsity here last fall. And among the preachers there, that is, you two preachers and some missionaries and others, was Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, who followed Tom Morgan in London, is now perhaps the outstanding evangelical of, of England. He preached the sermon on the authority of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know what I was going to get into there when I met this man. But I tell you, brother, I haven't got over that sermon yet. And here's a little more some of the things he said. He said this. He said, all down through history, the Holy Ghost has been sovereign in his church, and he won't let anybody else be sovereign. He takes all the authority and demands it and will have it. And if you take it away from him, he'll desert the church. He said, now history has shown that down through the years, down through the centuries, when every church, the evangelical church, got into a low state, needed a revival, usually a lot of learned brethren got together and said the trouble with the church is we're not respected intellectually. So they began to write very heavy intellectual books. And to try to show that Christianity and philosophy were pretty close together, he said, he, he told about the different movements that had tried that. He said, in every single instance, God ignored them, poured the Holy Ghost out on some simple people and sent his revival. He ignored the Oxford movement and sent the Holy Ghost on the Wesley's and the rest, and thus they had their revival. Now, there's a movement today abroad, I'm not going to name names, but I hope you're well read enough to know who I'm talking about, and they're my friends, too, my friends. But they have the idea that our trouble is we're too ignorant. The trouble you people is you don't have enough gray matter, and uh, that Christianity is losing out because we don't have enough gray matter. We haven't uh, enough education, and they say that if we, from the standpoint of philosophy and science, can prove Christianity to be true, we'll win. Well, they were running high for a while, but watch out. God will pass them up just as sure as you live, for the wise man and the great man and the mighty man never had any standing before God Almighty. It's always the simple-hearted man, the lowly man, the humble man who believes in a Savior at the right hand of God in the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. You watch it now. You watch it. Brethren, I want to stand here to prophesy. God will ignore this neo-orthodox, or this uh, not neo-orthodoxy, that part of their belief, at uh, least marginal, but it's what I call evangelical rationalism. It is an attempt to explain Christianity in philosophical terms. You can't do it, for it can't be done. It is a mystery, and no man knows anything unless it be given to him from God. And the simplest, hardest person in the state of Pennsylvania that believes in God and trusts his Son will have more understanding of things that matter than all of these learned brethren who write in their great big books. For Christianity is a mystery. It is a wonder. It is in this world a contradiction, and it upsets us, and backs us down, and defeats us, and humbles us, and we go forth in the strength of God Almighty. But as soon as we think we have some brains, or we have some money, or we have some talent, or we have some gifts, as soon as we arrive there, we begin to lose out, and that's where we are today. The evangelical church is trying to be like the world, 
And the result will be that in another short generation, that same evangelical church will be liberal. So we're moving toward liberalism in evangelical church. But you think that'll be the end of the church if the Lord tarry? Ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, no. The Lord will find some little old freckle-faced fellow with ears like taxi cab doors standing open, who maybe never had much education and the Holy Ghost will fall on him, and he'll stand to contradict the world. Not to be taken in by the world and kissed and loved, but to contradict the world and to tell the world it's sinful. And that's all I'll bring the revival that we need. But we'll never get it the other way. Well, you're a funny bunch. You're a funny bunch. You're like a swan walking out on the sidewalk. You're awkward and queer and out of place. You don't belong here, and yet you're here. God wants you to tell this story while you're yet here. One of these days, you're going to spread your wings and go where you'll be at home. Glory to God, man, like a swan in the sea or like a night hawk in the air, you'll be at home, and they'll understand you up there. And there won't be an archangel nor a seraph that will come and look at you and call you crazy. They only do it down here, and the reason is you're born out of due time, and you're a citizen of heaven walking on the earth, and you're a strange contradiction. And I pray to God Almighty you'll be a contradiction till you die. If you ever surrender and give up to the world, you've already lost your power. Well, that's enough. All right. Turn on you, please, to the book of First Peter. First Peter. I'm deliberately going to preach and not uh, reminisce or try to say a lot of things, because if I did, I'd be at one o'clock. So I'm going to read the scriptures and preach. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He let Do you think, does that sound as bad to you as it does to me? <laughs> uh, my teeth are in, but it sounds as if they weren't. Uh, that's uh, bother you back right there? What are you saying here? Any place at all? And they're never, never two of these alike. They all differ. Now I'll start again with verse two. The elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, preserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein we greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Now I have in mind particularly verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice. The Bible is very sparing in its adjective, and when it uses one, there's always a reason. He didn't say wherein you rejoice, or oh, this is an adverb, really, but it's a modifier, and uh, he says wherein you greatly rejoice. 
So now for a season it needs be unheaviness through, and he could have said temptation, but he didn't, he said manifold temptation. Now that's what I want to talk about. He said in verse 5, unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now these Christians look for a state of things, faith to them. To all the New Testament Christians, faith was not a nickel in the slot, pull down the lever and take what you want and go and write a tract about it. That, that's our idea of faith. But to the old, to the new old Christians of New Testament times, faith was a telescope. And they looked far off. And oftentimes, death interrupted them while they were looking and they died with a smile on their face, looking far off. And seeing the things that were to come, and thus they all died in faith. Now these Christians, uh, to whom Peter wrote, and Peter himself, looked for a state of things immeasurably better than anything we know now or they knew then. It was to be that state perfect and complete, and ye that have begun a good work will perfect it until the day of Christ. And it was to affect your body. First Corinthians 15 deals with that. But there's a time coming when we're going to have better bodies. We're a very body conscious people. We even have a new disease called psychosomatic disease. Psycho means your nerves and mind, and somatic means your body. So they teach us now that we get sick in our body because our mind is not well. And they, they think they've discovered something. And actually, John the Beloved knew that 2,000 years ago and wrote that I pray that you may, your soul may prosper, your body may prosper, even as your soul prospers. He knew that. He knew all about psychosomatic long before these fellows from the university knew about it. And uh, we, uh, the early Christians, believed that there was a time coming, Paul wrote about it in a long chapter in First Corinthians, when we'd have a body somewhat like our own, but glorified and like Jesus Christ, and immortal so it couldn't die, and incorruptible so it couldn't rot, and perfect so that you couldn't add anything to it, uh, like Jesus. And Paul took a whole chapter to tell us about that. I didn't used to read that chapter with any great amount of interest, but I am very much interested in it lately, and I think you know why. Because I am nearing, uh, a little nearer now than the time when I first was running around these grounds with my hair black and in place. And now what I have is gray, but uh, where the rest of it is, God only knows I don't. Now, not only was the body to be affected for the better, but the mind and the soul also. John told us that, uh, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and we do not yet know what we're going to be like, but we do know this much. When we, he returns and we see him, we're going to be like him. Now, that's all I ask for, my brethren. I don't ask for anything any more than that. For that reason, I am not going to write any books on the state of the body and the glorified uh, condition. Because I don't know very much about it, but I know that if we're going to be like him, that will be enough for all things and angels and seraphim and cherubim for all time to come. And then in Romans 8, Paul tells us that even the earth is going to be better off. He tells us that conditions at that time are going to be better, for he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So those Christians were looking forward to a time when even nature should be purified and we should be delivered from the curses round about us. There'd be no tidal waves and no cloud burst and no floods and no forest fires and no polio.